Hey everybody, and welcome all of you to the live program number 145 at Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Nikhil Vasuputi from the United Kingdom. Dr. Vasuputi is currently a consultant orthopedic surgeon in the United Lincolnshire Hospitals. His subspecialty interests are foot and ankle surgery and diabetic foot reconstruction, in addition to managing general trauma. He has completed foot and ankle fellowships in Southampton University Hospital and the University Hospital of South Manchester. He has undergone diabetic foot reconstruction training at the King's College Hospitals, London. His research interests are in Charcot foot reconstruction and local antibiotic treatment for diabetic foot. Dr. Nigel has over 20 publications, including the JBGS and also the Foot and Angle Surgery Journal. He's actively involved in teaching and training and regularly teaches on the FRC's courses and lectures in national and regional meetings. Today, it's my great honor to introduce you to Dr. Nigel Vasukuti for a fantastic lecture on metadoxalgia evaluation and management. Over to you, Nigel. Thank you very much, uh, Hitesh. Uh, thank you for the opportunity for this and uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Now, um, this afternoon, we'll have a discussion on metatasalgia, how to approach it and how to manage it. Now, uh, this is where I work in Lincolnshire. I work across uh, multiple sites. Uh, this Lincolnshire is a rural county in England. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what are we doing today? Metatarsalgy is a fairly common condition and sometimes very poorly recognized. Um, we'll just go through anatomy, biomechanics, and the etiology, then classification management. Um, we'll go through some common conditions that will lead to metatarsalgy, like Freiburg's, and we'll discuss um, common treatment modalities and we'll try and put together an algorithm to approach this problem. Now, what is metatarsalgia? It is not a specific condition. It is, a, it is in a way a vague term defining a symptom. So metatarsalgia means just pain and inflammation un, in the forefoot or under the metatarsal head. So it's mostly localized to the forefoot, that is the metatarsal phalangeal joints. It's more common than we think if you consider that it's present in nearly 10% of the general population, but only a small subset of them come to you with symptoms. And you see uh, most of uh, your patient cohort is made up of middle-aged women. Now we'll just go to the surgical anatomy. When you talk about anatomy of the metatarsals, uh, one uh, name that comes is um, Michael Maestro. Michael Maestro has uh, written this uh, classic paper in 2003, where, we, where he looked at the forefoot morphology and its relation to um, forefoot pain and metatarsalgia. So if you look at the, uh, the metatarsal parabola, as we call it, uh, the arc formed by the metatarsal heads. So the first and second, they're almost the same, then, to from three to five, they slowly decrease in length. So there's a difference of about four, six, and 12 millimeters. So that is um, called a maestro's arc or the metatarsal, parabo metatarsal parabola. If they follow this pattern, then it's called a harmonious arc. We'll come to that in more detail. Another aspect of um, the metatarsal anatomy is the decreasing declination. By declination, I mean the downward slope. So if uh, the second metatarsal is about between 15 and 20 degrees, then the, the lateral metatarsals up from three, four, and five, the declination or the downward slope decreases. So this is something you have to bear in mind when you plan surgery or for forefoot problems. Now, um, function, are these metatarsals mobile? How mobile are they? So when you manage and fix list frank fracture dislocation, this is something you'll have to keep in mind. So one, two, and three have very little movement. Uh, well, two and three have practically no movement because they're constrained. You can see that second metatarsal is wedged between the two cuneiforms. The first ray has some movement. Uh, normally, obviously you have um, TMT instability, and various conditions related to that. 
but the first ray has about five to 10 degrees uh, movement. Four and five are more mobile. Now, um, I mentioned the harmonious arc. So there are um, situations where you have a non-harmonious arc. So where the two and three can be long, like the M2, M3 long morphotypes, the M4, M5 means the, uh, the fourth and fifth metatarsals. So M4, M5 hyperplasia morphotypes. Then you have the M1 long and the short M1. So these are the abnormalities that could lead to problems um, with the weight bearing and walking. And they manifest when, you know, your patient is in their 40s or 50s. Uh, this is another way of, uh, you know, calculating the length. So your uh, main axis, that's one way to draw the axis, a long axis along the second metatarsal that ideally should come through the uh, lateral end of the navicular and into the telonavicular. It should be a telonavicular bisector. That's your normally aligned foot. So when you get a standard dorsal plantar view x-ray, it should be that line, it should line up. Okay. From there, you can draw this line, this horizontal line from the lateral or the fibula sesamoid to the head of the fourth metatarsal. So that line helps you decide the length of each metatarsal. Now, also in this context, uh, it's important to remember the anatomy of the MTP joints and the lesser toe. Uh, think where the collaterals are, where the flexors and extensors attach, because that dynamic interaction um, leads to uh, problems, uh, deformities like plateau and hammer toe. Now, um, we'll just look at the biomechanics of the foot. If you think of it, um, your, your foot, your, you're not mobile on a wheel, okay? So your foot is not like a wheel, but you expect it to do things like a wheel. You, you want to go take it and take you forward as fast as something on a wheel. So that is why your nature has adapted your foot uh, to work like a wheel. So how does it do that? With the rockers. So your foot has got three rockers, okay? So this is a basic element of the biomechanics of the foot. So you have the first rocker, second rocker, and the third rocker. Your first rocker is a heel rocker. When you actually put your heel down to the ground and then your foot goes flat on the ground. That's your, that's your, your fulcrum is a heel. That's your heel rocker. Your second rocker, your foot is flat and then your tibia and the body rolls across the foot. That's your second rocker or it's called the ankle rocker. And your third rocker is a forefoot. So where you have your heel comes off the ground and then your body is propelled forward when the MTP or the metatarsophalangeal joints dorsiflex. So these are the three rockers um, that help you propel forward. So this is a key element of understanding what metatarsalgia is. Obviously, another aspect of your foot biomechanics is understanding the subtalar joint movement, it's pronation and supination. So when your foot goes flat, your foot, it goes slowly into pronation and makes it flexible and adaptable to various surfaces. So your foot adapts to a flat surface or an uneven, irregular surface like a country road. And then when you're ready to toe off, your foot supinates and forms a rigid lever so that you can propel forward. So on one hand, your foot is flexible to adapt to uneven surfaces. And on the other hand, it becomes rigid when you want to propel forward. So that is uh, what um, nature has done to your foot. Um, that's why they say the human foot is quite unique. No other animal or no other creature has got a, such a, a foot like this. Now, metatarsalgia, there are two broad types. One is propulsive metatarsalgia and static metatarsalgia. So propulsive metatarsalgia is more in the third rocker where you can see in that line drawing as the foot propels forward, the metatarsal goes, becomes almost vertical. And when it becomes vertical, that ball of your toe takes a lot of load. And if your one of your metatarsals is longer, they don't take the load evenly. And the longer one takes more pressure. And then you have the scallus. 
callus that becomes quite painful. On the other hand, static metatarsalgia is for all other, uh, so second rocker problems when the foot is equinus, where you have a point loading. And I don't know how clearly you can see on this picture, but there's a small callus there. That is not due to a length problem, but that is because of the angle of declination of the metatarsal. So that happens when the foot is flat. And again, if you have tight gastrocnemius or a tight calf muscle, uh, there's point loading there. So that is static metatarsalgia. And here it is uh, propulsive metatarsalgia. Um, it may seem uh, complicated to the uninitiated, but you know, if you keep this in mind and every patient you see try to work out that way, it becomes easier because the type of operation you choose is different for both. Now, um, some classifications, um, you know, just for, for a, from a theoretical point of view, you have to have a system. So you have primary metatarsalgia, secondary metatarsalgia, and then you have iatrogenic metatarsalgia. Primary, again, you know, as the name say, uh, suggests, it is primarily a problem with the metatarsal, you know, the length or the angle of declination, uh, or a metatarsal head anatomic anomaly, then secondary is due to other causes like malalignment outside the foot, like knee problems or ankle problems, instability, neurologic problems. Iatrogenic is following failed surgery. The most common is um, failed first ray surgery, or even doesn't have to be failed first ray surgery, even in a successful first ray or the so-called successful first ray surgery, if you made it too short, as some, uh, sometimes uh, happens, you have met, uh, the load transferred to the lesser metatarsals, that is iatrogenic metatarsalgia. Another way of classifying is looking at static and dynamic and looking at the causes in each level, leg, ankle, and foot. And for each uh, level, there are various anatomic uh, conditions that can lead to metatarsalgia in the leg if you have malalignment at the knees, genovarum valgum. Similarly, at the ankle, if you have equinus due to tight gastrox. Uh, again, if you have planus or cavus feet, that can all lead to uh, problems in your forefoot. Um, yeah, again, dynamic um, muscular imbalance, cavus and planus, first rate disorders, uh, lesser MTP joint instability, like due to plantar plate rupture or chronic plantar plate uh, problems. Now, coming on to the next step, assessment. Now, how you assess this is key in, uh, because a patient comes to you with a pain, it's a vague symptom, pain in the foot, so they don't even point to where the pain is. And sometimes the patients cannot localize where the pain is. So it is important, you have to step back and rather than concentrating on the forefoot or the you know, metatarsal head, you have to look at the whole leg. As uh, we are taught in our, uh, you know, in our basic training, you have to examine the whole limb. And this goes with, uh, you know, forefoot problems as well. So expose the whole low limb, at least from the knee down. Check the knee alignment. Look for genovarum valgum. I'll come to that in a minute. Why? Then look at the hind foot alignment. Get the patient standing barefoot. Look at the patient from the back and as well as from the front to check the uh, alignment of the heel. Check the calcaneum is under the tibia. Look at the arch of the foot pick up any focal points of tenderness, look at the callosity. So I've told you how the callosity will be different in various types of metatarsalgia. Look for fat pad atrophy, look for obvious forefoot disorders and check for MTP joint instability. Now x-rays, uh, if uh, one problem I have, or you know, most of us have is and the patients come to you with x-rays already organized by a primary care physician or uh, you know, a general orthopedic colleague, they have just a standard AP and oblique views. But it's important to get weight-bearing x-rays or standing x-rays to reveal uh, certain deformities or certain, I mean, like when you look at a hallux valgus, you always look at only weight-bearing x-rays. Uh, flat foot, you can't assess a flat foot on non-weight-bearing x-rays. Similarly, for this problem, you have to get weight-bearing x-rays, AP and lateral, and also get an ankle AP. And this, I'm sure most of you are aware, is what we call a Salzman's hind foot view. So 
you have you can assess the um, alignment of the leg in and the alignment of the heel so you can check where the heel is in relation to the tibia so if they obviously the calcaneum is in as in a cavus foot or out as in a plane of algus foot so getting proper x-rays again is very important here you can see um, what a standard x-ray in a well-aligned foot will look like so your talus and your uh, uh, first metatarsal should be coaxial and your uh, second metatarsal is bisecting the talus and the calcaneum here you can see that now this line is important in assessing your uh, maestro's arc because that line joins the center of the fibula sesamoid to the center of the fourth metatarsal and uh, ideally it should be roughly perpendicular to the uh, this long axis may not always be but roughly now um i will broadly discuss the management options and then go into some specific conditions and specific operations now although it is uh, you know uh, conservative management although initially appears um, less sexy for this but um, it uh, goes a long way in uh, managing your patient's symptoms because a lot of patients do respond and do very well with conservative management. So that's where your history becomes very important. Uh, ask them what their job is, how, many, how much time do they spend on their feet? Like you will have a patient who's an IT professional just sat down. You will have a patient who's a long distance runner. You will have a patient who's, who works in a supermarket and stands on his or her feet for eight to 10 hours a day. So um, lifestyle modification and weight loss advice is very important. I've had patients who just by changing their job have had com have significant relief of symptoms. I mean, here we have patients uh, who work in the supermarket, spend six to eight hours on their feet. When they move to like sitting down at a till or sitting down in an office looking at accounts, their symptoms settle substantially. So. Lifestyle modification can be um, a major factor. And again, losing weight. Then um, other non-operative measures, calf stretches, we'll come to the mechanism of that in a minute. Then shoe modifications and insoles. Insoles, uh, there are um, various insoles out there on the market. A lot of patients try these, get them, just get them from Amazon and try this before coming to you. So the moment they you mention insults, they say, oh, no, no, I've tried that for one year. I've tried that for two years. Please don't give me any more insults. But again, there are different types of insults. I mean, this uh, literature says these teardrop-shaped pads, they're much better um, at, at uh, reducing the peak pressure under the metatarsal heads. Um, then metatarsal bars, they can offload your metatarsal heads, but uh, patients are not very compliant with those. And again, there are papers looking at the position of these, and they've shown that oblique position gives greater pressure reduction. Um, custom molded insoles, again, have been shown to be uh, better at controlling pain. Now, the problem with this, usually we just write orthosis and send it to the um, orthotist or your surgical appliance specialist. So if you have a very good surgical appliance specialist who is uh, good with foot and ankle problems, then it's fine. You can leave it to their uh, discretion to assess and give them the proper insoles. But not all of us may have that. And then if you have like a general orthotist, they will just give them an insole. And I've had uh, patients with the uh, cabaverous foot being, being just given a similar insole as someone with flat foot. So, just a foot, just a uh, silicone padding may not be enough. So it may be useful to specify what you're after. And the importance of uh, proper orthosis and proper lifestyle modification cannot be overemphasized. Again, non operative treatment, gas name is stretching. Calf tightness, um, as I'll come to in a minute, um, has got a significant impact on. Uh, the four foot oil loading. So gas name is stretching is very important. You have to check the complaints of the patient. Uh, most patients um, spend a few sessions with the physiotherapist and then they stop doing it. 
So when they come back and say, oh, I've tried physiotherapy for six months, so when you ask them to show you what they're doing, and uh, you'll be surprised that most of them don't know what they're doing or they're not doing the right things. Now, surgical treatment, it's important to identify the causative factor and your treatment should be tailored to the causative factor. And uh, usually most of these are targeted to reducing the pressure under your metatarsal heads. Surgery for specifically for the metatarsal does one of two things, either shorten the metatarsal or elevate the metatarsal head. And osteotomies have been around for over 100 years. And if you look at literature, um, I think more than 20 to 30 osteotomies have been described. When so many options are available, it means that none of them are effective till this gentleman from Chicago, Weil from uh, Chicago described the Weil's osteotomy in 1992. This was popularized in, in Europe by Frenchman Baruch. Now, your surgical management, like I said, you have to assess the patient, the whole lower limb. So if you, if you just foot, look at the foot, um, you may miss these deformities. So if you have a patient with genuvarum, it, it'll overload the lateral raise. So they mean need appropriate osteotomy to correct that. Similarly, genuvalgum can overload the medial raise. So it's very, very important to assess the whole um, lower limb. Now, check the hind foot, pest cavus. If the patient has got um, a cavavirus foot or pest cavus, um, manage that appropriately. Uh, clearly go for orthotic management first. And then if they don't respond to that, um, plan your surgery according to your type of deformity, flexibility or rigidity of the deformity. You have uh, your a la carte options for uh, uh, cavavirus foot management, um, your bony osteotomies, and your soft tissue correction. Again, pest planus, um, you have uh, similar osteotomy, uh, bony corrections, and soft tissue correction. So many options are out there. Now, check your gastrocnemius tightness. Um, if you analyze the gait cycle, the forefoot pressure is highest in the 60th to 90th percentile of stance phase. That is the second half of stance phase when you're going from foot flat to toe to heel off and toe off. That is when the forefoot pressure is highest. And it, they've shown that papers have shown that patients with metatarsalgia or forefoot problems, their, their ankle dorsiflexion is less than someone without forefoot pain. So why is, um, that's why gastrocnemius stretching or assessing the tightness of your calf muscle is so very important. Now, uh, stretching of the muscular tendinous unit, um, that MT means muscular tendinous unit. Um, here, the lengthening occurs by viscoelastic deformation. Now, stretching can be either concentric stretching or eccentric stretching. And uh, stretching, beyond the elastic limit can lead to uh, deformation or the deformation we want here is uh, lengthening. But it has been shown that effect is transient. So it is important that they carry on the stretching for beyond their uh, treatment course with your physiotherapist. And uh, increase in dorsiflexion has been noted when patients are assessed eight weeks after, but if they don't keep with the stretching program, this can be transient. And they advise uh, at least a thrice, three times a day of stretching and uh, up to a total of 20 to 30 minutes. Now, um, calf muscle, you know, it's made up of the soleus and the gastrocnemius. Gastrocnemius is a biarticular muscle. It crosses two joints. And um, you need an ankle dorsiflexion of at least 10 degree with the knee extended for normal gait. And if the dorsiflexion is reduced, the center of pressure, it moves to the metatarsal heads. So you exert more pressure in the forefoot and the hind part of the foot less, uh, takes less load. And it has been shown that patients with foot pain, 87% of them had gastrocnemius uh, tightness and this is a fairly large series. 
this is something that's familiar to all of us, uh, the silver scale test. Um, it tests whether you have isolated gastrocnemius tightness or the whole cuff muscle tightness. And if you have a patient with heel malalignment, specifically valgus, it is very important to correct the valgus, get the heel under the tibia before you dorsiflex to do this test. So that's the key element. There's something we teach all our uh, trainees and residents. Now, gastrocnemius lengthening uh, or the gastrocnemius release, whichever way you want to call it, um, there are so many of them described. You have the proximal release, uh, like the proximal medial gastrocnemius release, where you just release the medial head of the gastrocnemius through a short incision just below the popliteal fossa. And then you have the Bowman's release, where it's uh, the junction of the proximal third and the middle third. Then you have the more distal release. You have the strayers. Strayers is just a transverse release across the gastrocnemius saponeurosis. Then you have vulpius where you have uh, you make multiple cuts in the muscle. Then you have the Baker slide. Baker slide you make a box cut um, in the tendon, and then you you attain the dorsiflexion you want, and then repair it. So you have a more controlled uh, lengthening in Baker slide. Then if you have whole calf muscle tightness, you have um, several other types of TA lengthening described, Hoke test, Hoke's uh, release, Whites, Pelis, et cetera. So um, there are various advantages and disadvantages for each. Uh, clearly, you have to decide whether you need a TA lengthening or just a gastrocnemius lengthening, depending on your clinical assessment. And then between these, there's a lot of individual variation. Some surgeons uh, report good results with proximal, and you know it's, each one has their own favorite. I personally do a lot of strayers. I've done a few proximal releases, and obviously, if the tendonculus release is indicated, I do for a uh, go for a percutaneous hokey type of release. Ideally, you need control lengthening through the smallest incision without damaging the neurovascular structures. And again, patient positioning is important because a um, lot of your procedures, the TA lengthening or the gastrocnemius lengthening will be part of multiple other reconstructive options. So uh, you have to choose one that does not involve a great deal of patient uh, change in the patient position because you don't want to make your anesthetist and rest of the team unhappy rolling the patient over multiple times. Now, proximal and distal gastrocnemius release, what are the differences? Proximal gives you an aesthetically better scar. Distal, obviously, you have a more visible scar lower down, which uh, you know, all, uh, all your patients may not be happy with that. Proximal, you can go for early weight bearing. The chance of weakness is less. Um, and there is a risk of um, injury to saphenous you know, and vein in the proximal release. On the other hand, there is a risk of injury to sural nerve in the distal release. You get a better correction in very tight situation in the distal release. But then the downside is if you have an active person or a sports person, you can give them about 20% weakness in dorsiflexion. So for, for your running athlete, that could be a problem. So these are the factors you have to consider when you weigh, you know, you weigh your risks and benefits. Post-operatively, give them a splint. Early weight bearing is what I would advise. Um, but may, uh, they should, you should ensure they use a night splint for at least six weeks. Um, there are lots of papers on outcomes. Um, and there's a lot of discussion about endoscopic release. Personally, I don't have any experience with endoscopic release. Um, the risk of uh, neurovascular complications uh, would be higher in endoscopic release. Now, going to a specific condition, Freiburg disease. Freiburg disease is uh, a condition where you have an infarction and multiple microfractures in the metatarsal head. More commonly seen in second metatarsal because you know the most common deformity is the long set, second metatarsal. Um, you have, uh, they go through these various stages um, as I have uh, uh, shown shown this picture I've taken. 
um, spore and eventually the metatarsal head loses its shape. Freiburg, um, it's mostly due to stress, stress uh, during the third rocker and there is axial loading on the metatarsal head which leads to localized uh, stress concentration um, and uh, the, this compression of the cancellous bone. So here um, your, your body itself tries to shorten your long uh, uh, metatarsal and uh, it tries to innovate, tries to achieve uh, an ideal parabola if you look at it that way. Um, this is one condition that is much more predominant in females, especially young adolescent athletes. Second metatarsal is by far the most common one uh, affected. You can see that X-ray where the head is sclerosed and collapsed. Uh, this MRI scan shows high signal in the whole of the metatarsal head. This is what you would see intraoperatively. You can see an area where the um, cartilage is damaged and down to bone. Treatment options, uh, clearly non-operative options, as I had mentioned earlier, would go first. When it comes to surgical options, uh, this osteotomy described by Gothia about 40 years ago um, is still quite popular. Um, in Gothia's original publication, he had 52 out of 53 patients with uh, good symptom relief. So here, the basic principle is try to bring the normal articular cartilage and the well-rounded uh, bone up to articulate with your phalanx. So you take a dorsal-based wedge and uh, with a maintaining a plantar hinge there, and then rotate the head so that the relatively normal bone and cartilage articulates and forms your MTP joint. So that's the basic principle of a Gauthier osteotomy. It's basically a corrective or a rotation osteotomy. This is... Uh, something I haven't seen being performed. I just picked this up from a uh, paper. Um, do race there. They say they just take off uh, the damaged head and then you end up with a flat head, which is uh, contoured to form an articular surface. There's, not, not, there's nothing, in the, not a great deal in the literature about this. Whilst, whilst is something um, I like doing. Um, it's a, uh, you get reliable correction, predictable results. Um, here you modify the Wiles principle. You take a small dorsal wedge, then you slide and shorten it and fix it. That's a modified Wiles uh, for the Freiburg. Looking at evidence, this systematic review that came out about five years ago, they've looked at 38 publications with over 320 feet and uh, they report 90% symptom relief for joint preserving procedures. That would be those the Wiles and um, the Gauthier's, the rotation osteotomies. And for joint destructive procedures like um, open debridement uh, and microfracture, there'll be this uh, slightly less success reported. Now, Wiles osteotomy. This by far has become the uh, favored, most popular surgical option for forefoot problems. So it's first uh, described by this gentleman, uh, while from Chicago um, in the early 90s, if I remember right. Um, in Europe, it was popularized by Baruch, Louis Baruch. He's a, he's a pioneer of forefoot surgery from France, Bordeaux in France. And he's popularized by Wiles osteotomy in uh, mainland Europe and uh, UK. So what are the indications for a Wiles osteotomy? Um, indications are a third rocker metatarsalgia where you have a long metatarsal and it achieves a shortening without elevation or depression. Then in toe deformities like hammer toe, claw toe, MTP joint dislocations, in second space syndrome where you have widening of the second space. So you have adduction of the second toe and abduction of the third toe. Then overlapping toes, wind swept toes. A lot of these uh, sagittal plane and coronal plane deformities, whilst is a very reliable operation with predictable results. And uh, you can control it. Uh, you can control how much you shorten. You can control if you want to change the coronal plane alignment and uh, you get like as predictable results with uh, very, very 
low or uh, non-existent non-union rates. Yeah, I've mentioned that already shortening and lateral and medial displacement. Um, in this context, it's important to think about the metatarsal blood supply. So you have uh, the dorsal metatarsal artery and the plantar metatarsal arteries, the first there, the distal one there, and the proximal one further up there. So the, your metatarsal clearly, metaphysical area clearly has a better perfusion, better blood supply. So osteotomies in that area heal better than your diaphysial osteotomies. So your diaphysial osteotomies are more prone for non-union. Now templating, um, just like your arthroplasty surgeons template for the hips and knees, uh, this is one situation where templating will be useful. You don't want to shorten too much and you don't want to end up transferring your metatarsalgia from your second ray to your third ray or henceforth. So with the digital x-rays uh, these days, you, you can maybe print off your x-ray and actually um, draw using tracing paper. Basically, you just decide how much you need to shorten. Once you draw those lines, um, you can make an assessment of how much you need to shorten. And with whale sauce, you, you can control how much you shorten. Incision, you can use a longitudinal incision or a transverse incision. If you need to do two or more you can uh, use a transverse incision. Um, you don't want, if you want to do multiple vials, you don't want to be doing um, parallel longitudinal incisions because of the risk of skin necrosis and soft tissue problems. The key points um, to consider is, excuse me, avoid excessive stripping of the soft tissues. Um, and it's very important to preserve the collateral ligaments because you want your MTP joint stable and you want control of your distal fragment. So it's important to not to strip off the collateral ligaments because it's very tempting to strip off the soft tissue and get a good view and then make your cut. And you generally don't need that. Then this is an intra-articular cut. Your starting point should be slightly distal to where the articular cartilage meets the bone. Then again, the next important point is get it parallel to your weight-bearing plane. So if you watch your trainee or resident do it, they tend to tilt the saw forward and make a more perpendicular cut. So, so get your foot alignment right. And the best way to get it right is your saw should be in line with your the weight-bearing plane of the foot. And it roughly translates to about 20 to 25 degree to the metatarsal. Now, that is for the second metatarsal, I would say. As you move further laterally, um, as, I as I've said, uh, the, ankle, the angle of declination decreases as you move laterally. So you have to adjust your angle of the cut accordingly. As you move further lateral, reduce this angle. Then once you make your cut, um, the, the head of the metatarsal slides, and usually the tissue tension you can see it fall back due to the tissue tension and usually finds its position. But you have to make sure it doesn't move too far proximal, um, which I will uh, mention later why. Um, and once you get your ideal position, you can hold it with a clamp and fix it with a two millimeter twist off screw. Now, if you need a more than three millimeter shortening, it's better to do a second layer cut. So that is, uh, the so there you can see that's your line of your cut. Let it slide back and then fix it with screws. And once you fix it, um, generally one screw is enough, unlike in this picture. And this little beak of board, you can take that off and smoothen that. Um, might be mindful of your supporting structures, your accessory collateral ligaments. Do not strip them off. And then you, you must be familiar with these uh, fancy screws, the two stop screws. So you load these two stop screws in a low speed drill. And uh, as you drive them in, you don't need to pre-drill them. As you drive them in, um, when the head hits the bone, it snaps off here. And that's your fixation done. And it's quite stable, even with just one screw. Now, Baruch has modified it slightly for the double cut. So like I mentioned earlier, if you need to shorten more than three millimeters, and if you slide it further back, there's a lot of plantar flexion in this um, head, and you tend to 
elevate your head a bit and you tend to increase the pressure. So if you have to slide it more than three millimeter, it's better to do two cuts and take off a slice of bone. So you, you do not um, have that problem. You do not have the problem of uh, increased pressure under there. That's Baruch's modification. Now, a further modification from Machera is the triple vials. Now, what is the problem with the original vials, especially if you have, if you have to make significant shortening, you end, up make, you end up creating a difference in shape and alignment of the distal metatarsal articulating surface. And other problems are stiffness, floating toes. So to overcome these, there was this triple vials described. So you first make your cut, then you make a small, excise a small wedge of bone. So that is decided by the amount you need to take off. If from your templating, if you use template, uh, if you decide that you need to take three millimeter off, so the base of the triangle is three millimeter. So you make that cut from here, you measure three to four millimeter. I hope you can see my cursor. You measure three to four millimeter, then take off a triangle of bone. And from there, you make your second cut, excuse me. And um, then you take off that slice of bone, you have shortened it. While you have retained the uh, alignment and the you have retained the anatomy of the metatarsal head. You have not plantar flexed it. So your risk of having stiffness or risk of having floating toes is much less. Personally, I do not have any experience of this, but this is what uh, this is a this is worth knowing. If you want to try this, you can try this on a cadaver or something first and uh, do it. Evidence for whiles, there's a lot of papers. Um, uh, in 2005, there was a seven year follow up which showed nearly 90% good results. Uh, Myerson's paper showed 85% good results. Complication, this is one thing that will make your uh, patients or your young female patients unhappy is floating toe. So floating toe, it's not a small problem. It's a 30% uh, complication in literature. Um, I haven't seen in 30% of my cases, but I see maybe one in 10. I've seen, I can remember at least one in 10 of my patients come back with this. It's a difficult problem. And uh, you see that, especially if you have done a IP joint or PIP joint fusion along with this, and the whole of the, you know, the fused toe then uh, sticks up. Um, it is due to the dorsal soft tissue contracture. So one way to get over this is, uh, dressing in slight flexion, and then once they are mobile, get them to do passive stretches to, to make sure there is no dorsal scar contracture. Now, just some, uh, just a case example. This was a 48 year old lady who came to me about six to eight months ago with this. So her second toe was adducted, and this was a rubbing on the big toe, and uh, she was very unhappy with it because that nail was rubbing on the big toe leading to uh, like an impending pressure sore. So for her, I did a translation whilst, I'm not sure how clear it is this in this X-ray, it's remodeled a bit possibly. So I did a translation whilst. So in translation whilst, you shift your distal fragment. So here you shift your distal fragment medially. So basically you shift your distal fragment to the concavity of the deformity or in the direction that the toe points. And then that lines this up. So along with this, you can do some soft tissue application. You can do some release on the tight side and do application on the, uh, con on the convex side. So here, sl I slid the distal fragment towards the first metatarsal. And on the lateral side, it just tightened up like the soft tissues. Now, another osteotomy, described by these three gentlemen, Baruch, Ripstein, and Tulos. Um, so here they take a dorsal base wedge and close it and fix it with a screw. So this is useful for plantar flex metatarsals. It takes a, so this is useful for static metatarsalgia. You take a dorsal base wedge. Now, uh, minimally invasive surgery. This is the in thing these days and uh, all the younger generation of surgeons want to take this up. Um, you have to be very careful when you choose your patient for an MIS. Um, you do it for length pattern alterations, transverse plane deformities, and uh, in some situations, the subluxation MTP joints. Uh, Morton Polakot, he was the 
pioneer of uh, minimally invasive surgery when it was uh, popularized by other people. Now there is a MIFAS, the original name is in French, or the Minimally Invasive Foot and Angle Surgery Group in Europe. They are, the, they are responsible for uh, developing and validating um, and creating protocols for minimally invasive surgery. Um, Mariano Di Prado is a Spanish surgeon. Um, most of us go to him for, um, I went to him for the course on um, MIS. Um, so he is uh, one of the big names in um, MIS surgery in Europe. So you have to have an anatomy, an idea of, a clear idea of the anatomy of the foot. And it's very important to have the precise instruments that they're, uh, that they're prescribed for MIS. You cannot adapt or innovate by using different instruments for MIS surgery. You have to have the specific, the, the advice of Shannon burst, which are the side cutting burst, and then you need to have X-ray support. And very important as in any other condition, you do it only for the right indication, choose your patient. Um, so MIS surgery, you make a small incision with a beaver blade, that is the direction of, that's your Shannon burr or the side cutting burr. Um, st setup is fairly strand standard, you need X-ray. And once you made your incision, all done under X-ray control, use a small um, elevator to lift, to free up the soft tissue, lift up the periosteum. Then your burr goes in, you make the cut. This is, um, this is a low speed burr, low speed with high torque, and it's got um, continuous saline irrigation to avoid overheating. Then once you make your cut, you can see that this slides back and the soft tissue actually pulls it and it finds its own position. And that's why it's uh, important to get the patient weight bearing early. Remember that there is no a fixation, so your um, your dressing application should be properly done. You should not leave it to a junior surgeon to put the dressing on. Put your dressing on um, for get the alignment right, and the patient starts weight bearing in a stiff soled uh, flat shoe. Going on to metatarsophalangeal joint instability. This is another um, condition you should not miss when assessing for metatarsalgia. So there are various grades from no laxity to completely irreducible uh, MTP instability. And in severe cases, the, in a third rocker, you can have complete MTP dislocation and plantar plate rupture. Most of these are chronic plantar plate rupture where repair may not be possible. If a repair is possible, there are specialized kits available. Um, and this is more, more for the acute rupture the clean ruptures in a relatively younger, more active patient. So this is what, this is the Arthrex kit. This is the only one I have seen. Um, so you have the Arthrex Scorpion, where you do a wild osteotomy, then get your plantar plate, you open up the MTP joint, and then um, you make small drill holes in the base of the phalanx, take pull out stitches from the plantar plate and repair it there, then fix your osteotomy. Now, there are other conditions leading to metatarsalgia, crossover toes. Uh, there are sliding osteotomies. This is similar to the translation wiles that I showed you earlier. This is uh, called McAllister osteotomy. Now some case examples. Uh, this is a 60 year old who had um, hallux valgus correction done a, a few years ago by a very senior colleague, um, an akin osteotomy and um, I think it was a chevron. This was the patient she came to me and she was in a lot of pain under the secondary. So you can say she had a hemiphalangectomy there. Now that second metatarsal head is arthritic and she was in, she was in a significant amount of pain. Um, you can see that that raw bone is um, articulate rubbing there and you know why she has a pain. You can see the high signal there. So for her, I did a wild osteotomy, shortened it and now um, she's uh, got can see the relative lengthening there as well. So the shortening of the metatarsal um, and she, she's, uh, that relieved her pain. She's very happy with that now. This is uh, a young, this is a 19 year old um, with uh, long metatarsals. She had a problem with the tip of the second toes. So the second toes were curling in and rubbing in a shoe. Um, a colleague initially did an um, IP, joint, IP joint fusion, which helped her to a certain extent, but then when she came back 
with recurring problems, cellular shortening, while osteotomy there, and uh, that uh, relieved a pain. Now, treatment algorithm. So, metatarsalgia, you got multiple conditions at various levels, you know, right from the toes to the knees. Um, and how do you make sense of it? How do you have a protocol for treatment? It's difficult to have a protocol, but it, at least if you have an algorithm, something to guide you, it'll be helpful. So metatarsalgia with normal first ray, metatarsalgia with abnormal first ray, and metatarsalgia with inflammatory disease. That's how, um, that's a, a good a systematic way to approach it. So with a normal first ray, a well-aligned first ray, um, look for midfoot or hindfoot anomalies. So if you have a normal first ray, then look further beyond. If there are midfoot or hindfoot anomalies, like we discussed, correct that. Other, the other, another um, situation is when you have isolated metatarsalgia. So you either have a harmonious curve or a disharmonious curve. So harmonious curve, you have uh, gastro contractures, MTP instability, or a degenerative disease. And or you have a pest cave as high arch. High arch, you can do the BRT osteotomy that we had just discussed. Metatarsalgia with abnormal first ray, um, you either have normal length and inclination of the metatarsals or you have abnormal length and inclination. So if you have a first ray problem with normal length and then you just correct your first ray problem, that usually sorts the problem out. If you have a lesser ray problem as well, then you correct your first ray and then deal with your lesser ray problems with the wild osteotomy or soft tissue or whatever. And it's important to check for arthritis of the glis frank and midfoot joints. Now, if you have metatarsalgia due to inflammatory disease, um, so that's a situation you see in um, rheumatoid feet. You see less of these now with the medical management of rheumatoid arthritis so well advanced, um, but you do get the odd patient come to you with a really bad um, rheumatoid in the forefoot. So the old Fowler procedure where you do a first ray MTP fusion and the second ray excision arthroplasty. And these patients are so grateful because you have, you have relieved them of their uh, pain and the large calluses they have um, under the metatarsal heads. So that is one way of approaching these uh, problems. Right, so we are coming nearly to the end. Um, what are the take home messages? If you don't remember anything from this talk, please try to remember what is on this slide. So always examine the whole lower limb and that cannot be overemphasized. Look at the ankle, hind foot and the knees. Conservative treatment, majority of your patients will do well with non-operative measures. Uh, not all of them need your Shannon burrs and your uh, twist off screws. Soft tissue procedures can be effective. Not everyone needs an osteotomy. Identify the specific problem before you do an operation and you should know what you're correcting. If it, is, if it comes to a bony operation, then for propulsive metatarsalgia, it should be a shortening osteotomy. For a static metatarsalgia, it's usually an elevation osteotomy. That is uh, how Lincolnshire looks like in summer. And this is um, the, the, uh, the countryside of Lincolnshire called Lincolnshire Wolds. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Can Thank take you, Nigel, uh, for a fantastic presentation. You went into detail into the biomechanics of the feed and the length of the metatarsals as well. Few questions. One is, see, a long second metatarsal can be a very common problem. I mean, it's even seen in physio. Uh, it's a common anthropometric or morphological variation. So yes. how can you say that the long metatarsal itself is the cause for the pain? You can, of course, you can look at the you know, corn or a callus that can form at the second metatarsal head. What if the patient had a pain due to some other reason? How do you really ascertain before going in? So, so that's why the, where your assessment comes in. You have to make sure that itself is the cause for the pain. So um, first look at your look at your alignment, look at your soft tissue balancing, your gastrocnemius tightness. And if you have specific callus under the metatarsal head, okay? And uh, then, you know, if you have ruled out other causes, if you have a norm, uh, long metatarsal, I mean, not everyone with long metatarsal will have symptoms, but you have someone with a long metatarsal with a callus under it and pain localized to that, that region and you have 
ruled out other pathology, then you go down the route of managing that problem. But always, always go for non-operative measures first. You go for insoles and uh, stretch out your gastrox. And most patients will be specific. They will point to that. And they will point to that area as the source of their symptoms. And whatever the pathology, if you have a pro obvious problem asking for an operation, still in foot and angle, go for non-operative measures first. Um, there, is, there are no two ways about it. Always go for non-operative measures first, insoles and physiotherapy. I always send them for a three-month course of physiotherapy and ask them to wear modified insoles for three to six months before going down any bony operation. Even for a gastronomist release, a simple operation like a gastroc release, I always try three to six months of non-operative measures. I mean, a lot of patients, by the time they get to you from primary care, they would have had tried these. But even then, like I said, it is important to get the specific exercises in. It is important to get the specific type of insulin. And only after they fail that, only after you have ruled out any other pathology. Because sometimes uh, some of these patients for four foot pain, they may have Morton's neuroma. So you may need an ultrasound to rule that out. Sometimes it would be just like a bursitis that is the cause for the pain. So get a... Um, MRI scan to look for bursitis or a Morton's neuroma. And if you see an inflamed tissue, you can give an image guide a targeted steroid injection. Sometimes steroid injection takes away the problem. So your, uh, your bony procedure is the final. Because if that fails to relieve, relieve their symptoms, then you have come to the end of the road. Then, you know, uh, they're not going to be very happy with you. So make sure they're, they, I mean, one way we say is make sure your patient has earned the operation. Make sure they've done all the physio. Make sure they've used the insoles. You go through all the investigations. You do the injections and make your patient earn the operation. Thank you, Nigel. The other one, is there any uh, way to calculate or say that, okay, the second metatarsal is long. I, I'm sure that you mentioned about the harmonious curve and the disharmonious curve. Is there a percentage, like you compare with the first metatarsal head, okay, the second metatarsal has gone this much, long is there any way to do that i mean no one has described a threshold okay so i mean most of the case i have seen they're obviously long like the couple of x-rays i showed you they're obviously they're long by six seven eight millimeters there is a significant difference so um only i mean uh, not many people do specific measurements i mean you can do measurements before you do an operation but for your diagnosis there is no cutoff or there is no threshold uh, for the lesser metatarsal from three to five, um, those papers, Maestro's paper says you go four, six, 12, like that. But again, there's a lot of individual variations. And it's, if I measure five millimeter shot, then if I, uh, if you measure, it would be six or someone else measures at four. There's a lot of um, in their observer and intra observer variations in it. A lot of the software on PACS or the, the, the digital X-rays, you measure it on two different occasions, there'll be two millimeter difference. So it is not just a specific value that you're looking for. Okay, you see an obvious length and you see a problem and then a problem uh, that matches up with your, with your patient's uh, symptoms that has not responded to a non-operative measure, then that's when you go for it. Thanks for that. Uh, the other question is, have you encountered a scenario where a lumbar dis disease or a tarsal tunnel syndrome presents as a metatarsal here initially? Or do you consider in the differential diagnosis? Um, I mean, it could be a, it could be a differential, but I I haven't come across a case. I mean, nothing's come to me uh, like that, like a tarsal tunnel syndrome presenting with. I mean, tarsal tunnel syndrome presents with more with heel pain and hind foot pain. It's got that characteristic, you know, you have the burning type of pain, localized more to the hind foot than radiating to the forefoot, but it's primarily in the hind foot. And then you can elicit your tinnel sign and all that in the classic case. And for that sort of problem, an MRI usually gives you an answer. And um, you mentioned spine. Obviously, uh, you do your clinical examination properly there because they don't present with uh, they don't present with the localized forefoot pain as such. Do they? At least I haven't. I mean, they say in medicine nothing is impossible, but. I can't remember coming across one like that. I don't know, maybe uh, I missed someone. Like they say, I haven't seen it, but maybe it has seen me. So, uh, <laughs> but I can't remember anything like that, yeah. You haven't seen Corona, Corona has seen you probably. Yeah, yeah exactly. You haven't seen Corona, but Corona has been to see you, yeah. 
Okay, Nigel. Uh, Nigel, uh, before we conclude, one last question or just a couple of questions. See, a lot of uh, recent work has looked at gastronomic tightness for feet pain. For example, there are surgeons who believe that you do a gastronomic release or a recession for even plantar fasciitis. So, are we going, so for example, if you tell a patient with a feet pain, okay, your gastronomic is the problem, it's very difficult to convince it. So, what is your take on that? So, I mean, most... Of course, you do the silver score, all that. I agree with that. Yeah. No, so getting the pay, getting the, to convince the patient, I mean, for most of these foot problems or for any problem, really, um, patient education is an important part. So we spend, you know, for a new problem, for a new referral coming to us, you spend 20 minutes, sometimes 20 to, if you're listing the patient for a procedure, you spend more than 20 minutes talking to them. So um, I keep pictures and models in my clinic and I try to explain to them, I mean, explaining the, the pathology in as simple as in a simple way and explaining the operation you're going to do goes a long way in keeping your patient happy, especially some conditions like plantar fasciitis, you, you brought that up. It is a condition where you can't make some of your patients happy. Whatever you do, plantar fasciitis, the pain never goes away in some patients. So it's important to get the patient on board with proper patient education. So getting the patient to believe that um, there's a problem in your calf muscle that is causing your toe pain. Yeah, you're right. It's difficult to pain, <laughs> but that's where your patient education comes in. You have to explain to them that your calf is tight, which is why you're putting more load. That is why you got the callus. This is why you need this. You have to spend your time. I mean, there's no shortcuts to that. I mean, you know, it's it's a cultural thing as well. In some parts of the world, you 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 spend, you don't get to spend as much time with a patient, isn't it? I mean. Um, possibly in your part, you see much more number of patients in a session and get less time with, with a patient. So you may not get time. But here we make it a point to restrict the number of patients we see in a session and uh, you know, spend time trying to explain all this to them. Okay, so suppose you're planning, you have decided for okay, a gastronomic recession so, or release or whatever. Do you depend on solely on the silver score test or anything collaborative along with that? I mean, it's, it's all clinical examination. It's just clinical examination. Silver score, yeah. Only silver score. Because there is no, what is the other way of objectively assessing? There is no way of objectively assessing. I mean, uh, there are, in research, they've got all these um, goniometers and calipers where they measure the actual length. But it's your, it's your physical exam. Your clinical examination is the key thing, isn't it? So do you do the gastroc recession or uh, release for your plantar fasciitis? Any, because a lot of concerns about doing a plantar fascia release because of the alternation of the feet biomechanics. Yeah, plantar fascia, I have not done a plantar fascia release for plantar fasciitis, but I've done gastronomic release is an accepted, uh, most people do a proximal gastronomic release, but distal is also done. I've done a few gastronomic release when everything else fails in plantar fasciitis. Because if you do that early on, you don't, you don't want the patient's hopes too high too early on. So when all your conservative measures fail, I have done a gastronomic release for uh, plantar fasciitis. It is the, the literature, you know, the, all the evidence is not strong. It's possibly at the bottom of the pyramid, but there are series on where they look at gastronomic release for plantar fascia release. And uh, do you do a plantar fascia release at all for plantar fasciitis? Uh, only plantar fascia release I have done is for cava virus correction, but not for uh, plantar fasciitis. I've not done a plantar fascia release. I mean, we do what we call a needling procedure where you use a needle as a knife and under sedation, you do multiple tiny holes in the plantar fascia attachment. That is more to, re to improve the vascularization than more to improve the vascularity and healing than to actually do a release. So, but um, the answer to your question is no, no release for- That no would release. be something like the needle upon neurotomy that you do for the pupil prints. Yeah, I mean, they say it is, we are not actually doing a facial release with the needle. You're actually just, you know, making multiple holes and some stimulating, some healing, that's all. I think the, that's all the questions we have, Nikhil. Thank you for the fantastic session. Of course, a lot of information from the biomechanical point of view and how really you need to assess a patient who comes with the uh, four foot pain. Thank you very much for joining and it was fantastic listening to you. And I think we should have one more lecture later on from your side whenever you have time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you for the invitation. We'll end the session. Yeah. Bye.